Ellen mentioned the dash for cash during the COVID crisis, and that was a natural bridge to bring us to session two, which is entitled the dash for cash and the liquidity multiplier. Lessons from March 2020 that will be delivered by uh, Anil Kashyap, whom Richard Portas, my colleague, will introduce in a second. But let me please remind you to submit your questions throughout the session using the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screens. Um, please enter your name and affiliation, and we will read them out when asking questions to our speakers. Thank you. Richard, over to you. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, we are delighted to have with us Anil Kashyap. Anil is the Stingu Stevens Distinguished Service Professor of Economics and Finance at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. But he's speaking today in his capacity as an ex external member of the Bank of England's Financial Policy Committee, which is responsible for financial stability and macroprudential policy to ensure it. Now, for many years, Anil organized an important but informal annual forecasting competition among several academics and officials who do international macroeconomics and finance. I'm sad to say that we weren't very good at it, and he's probably kept records, which I hope he will never disclose. Some of his talk today is directed towards how we might map and monitor financial interconnections so we can foresee and avoid problems in funding chains. That would be a very constructive kind of forecasting. Anil, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Richard and Anna. Uh, I really appreciate this invitation. I was hoping to be here in person. And I look forward to seeing all of you face-to-face -face as soon as that's safe to do. I'm also especially pleased to be speaking at an event organized by the London Business School's AQR Asset Management Institute. AQR Capital Management was founded by several alumni of my home academic institution, and I actually even interviewed Cliff Asnes, the A in AQR, at a conference last week. Cliff and his colleagues are super thoughtful, and I'm sure that the interaction with the LBS faculty and alumni is rewarding for you and for them. So today, as, as Richard just mentioned, I'm here with my capacity as an external member of the UK Financial Policy Committee, although I should say these views are just my own. Our committee was created after the last financial crisis to try to make sure that the UK financial system is resilient to and prepared for the wide range of risks it could face. Our committee mantra is that we want the financial system to be able to serve UK households and businesses in bad times as well as good. And I, I'm gonna share my thinking today about some of the lessons for financial stability risks that became evident after the market disruptions in March of last year. The financial system plays three critical roles for society. It funnels savings to people who want to borrow, it helps people and businesses share risks, and it supports economic exchange by facilitating payments. I want to start by noting that many of these functions have moved uh, beyond the what we would call the traditional banking system uh, into what we now call the market-based financial system. And the landscape of the market-based financial system is quite diverse. It includes securities and derivatives dealers, asset managers, pension funds, insurers, a wide range of investment funds and money market funds. The chart gives you some numbers about how the shares have moved. I think more important than the exact numbers is just the direction of travel and the fact that the growth of the market-based financial system is likely to continue for the foreseeable future. So, what did we learn in March? Well, the news about the pandemic led many investors to rise their views about the risks uh, facing the economy and many asset prices needed to adjust. There are a lot of net narratives around what happened. And I wanna particularly recommend a couple of accounts by John Cunliffe and one by Andrew Hauser given in June for details. Today, I'm gonna to focus on one part of the story how chains in the entities that exist in the market-based financial system can contribute to problems during periods of stress. This leads me to focus on funding flows between different parts of the system. I'm gonna introduce the concept of a liquidity multiplier that's created by the presence of the chains and give some first thoughts on how this multiplier can create fragility. The analysis draws heavily on ongoing work that you'll be hearing more about from the Financial Policy Committee 
in the coming year. So think of my comments today as the opening of a conversation rather than any attempt at a final word. Um, I'm gonna split the rest of my remarks up into four parts. First, I'll describe a funding chain that's typical of those in the market-based finance system. We'll see that these chains can create five types of funding linkages. Next, I'll briefly review the events in March, focusing on the ones that are relevant for these linkages. Third, I'll give some illustrative calculations about how the liquidity multiplier can operate. And then I'll close with some policy questions that arise because of these chains in the liquidity multiplier. All right, so um, as I already noted, the financial system serves many purposes. And I'm gonna review kind of an illustrative chain here that's more motivated by US patterns. I picked the one I'm gonna talk about because I don't really wanna open a debate about the structure of the UK market-based financial system. So think of this as a way to make some analytic points rather than a map of the UK financial system with realistic estimates of the funding flows. I'm gonna just try to keep this conceptually mostly. So here's, here's my example. Consider a defined benefit pension manager, fund manager, who wants to keep liquid assets, who must need, must keep some liquid assets to pay out upcoming pension payments and to meet margin calls on derivatives. Suppose the, uh, the manager wants to diversify her counterparty risk, improve her cash management, and perhaps improve her return. How can she do this? Well, she can take some of the money that she keeps in the bank to meet these immediate outflows and place them into a money market fund. The money market fund uh, holding is redeemable and it may offer a better yield than a bank account. Now, the money market fund can do a lot of things with the cash. Some of the options include on depositing it in a bank, purchasing short-term paper, typically from other financial institutions, buying government debt, or perhaps lending the cash out via a reverse re repurchase agreement, receiving a bond as collateral. In my example, I'm gonna suppose the last choice is made and that a broker dealer is borrowing the cash. That contract might be for one night so as to ensure that the money market fund can get the money back if, if it faces redemptions. The broker dealer can then lend the cash to a client, let's say a hedge fund, often in a term uh, reverse repo transaction so that the broker dealer now has a, a maturity mismatch and it takes on this maturity mismatch because it wants to deliver some funding stability for its client. The hedge fund then can take the loan to invest, let's say in government bonds, but the chain could go on. I'm just gonna stop it here. One common head fund strategy is the so-called cash futures basis trade that John Cunliffe talked about last week. John described this in detail, so I'm gonna be brief here. The trade is usually described as a convergence trade where the hedge fund attempts to correct perceived mispricing between futures and cash prices of sovereign bonds. It's worth thinking a little bit about why this trading opportunity even exists. And my thinking is that it's a consequence of other actors in the market-based financial system trying to enhance the returns. For example, suppose you have an asset manager of a long-term bond fund who's seeking to boost returns. One way to do this is to buy futures contract to meet the investment mandate, and then take the funds that would have been invested in uh, the government bonds and instead buying higher yielding securities. This decision has several knock-on effects. First, the asset margin payments against the futures contract. Second, if the strategy is done in scale, the futures fund will be slightly distorted relative to the underlying bonds and it'll trade at a price that's higher than otherwise. Third, someone has to sell the futures contract to the asset manager through the exchange. If the price is distorted, it's likely the hedge fund stepping in to correct the mispricing. Whoever's performing that ar arbitrage will also post some margin. The hedge fund then buys bonds um, and pockets the difference in the prices between the futures and the bonds. These deviations are, are usually small. And so as John explained in his speech, that means the hedge funds would use considerable leverage to boost the returns. Uh, we'll see 
shortly why this leverage matters uh, if this is the investment that the hedge fund makes. So just hold that thought now. Before going on, let me let me call your attention to the fact that the individual firms in each of these examples are good reasons to conduct the transaction. They're all motivated by improving returns and recycling collateral in efficient ways. In particular, when a hedge fund manager boosts returns by borrowing to fund a position, the better returns for the pension fund mean less pressure on corporate sponsors to build deficits. Collateralized borrowing and lending is a relatively safe and cheap way to organize loans. The arbitrage trade reduces discrepancy in prices between uh, similar securities, and in this case, lowers borrowing costs for the government and ultimately the taxpayer. So there's nothing wrong with these transactions. However, the chains create interconnections that can create contagion in liquidity demands. And we're going to see generically that there are five ways that this can create funding needs for the various parties in these transactions. So let me go through them. First, any derivatives trading involves margin payments that protect both parties in the contract from future price movements. There's two types of margin payments. The initial amount posted that accounts for typical price fluctuations that occur. That's the initial margin. And that may need to be topped up when volatility increase. And the so-called variation margin reflects changes in the mark-to-market -market value of the derivatives positions, shifting money from losers to winners. Okay, so that's two, initial margin, variation margin. Next, there's the possibility of a redemption. Any investor in the money market fund may need their funds back, and so they could make a withdrawal. In that case, the money market fund must find a way to meet that redemption. There's a third draw. Finally, access to repo funding can change in two potentially offsetting ways. Many repurchase agreements, like the one in our funding chain, are short maturity. And Lenders may choose not to roll over the funding or to choose a much higher price. On the other hand, in our example, the broker dealers are providing an essential service to their client and are offering funding in the repo market. If the client wants additional funding, the broker dealer that refuses to provide it may risk losing the client. So the broker dealer may have to extend additional funding, even if it would prefer not to do so. So the observed repo volumes reflect the balance of these loans that are ultimately made. There may have been some that were rolled over and others that were reluctantly granted. We'll see in a moment how all this fits together, but before turning to the hypothetical example, let me just relate this to some of what we saw in March. Okay, so March saw, as I said, a deterioration in economic prospects and heightened uncertainty due to COVID. Loosely speaking, investors moved out of risky assets into safe assets as a result. There was also a heightened concern that the situation could deteriorate further. So it's likely some actors became more cautious about lending and retained funds on a precautionary basis. The asset price moves and increased volatility also led to large variation margin payments and higher initial margin requirements. Now, there's Lots of detailed accounts of the sequence of events in March, both in Bank of England speeches and staff analyses. So I'm, I'm not gonna recount that. I just wanna cut to trying to tell you what we know about the changes in the liquidity positions through the five channels that I've just man mentioned. And one of my punchlines is gonna be that our measurement of liquidity positions and funding flows is poor and is where more work could be done, including some that involves international cooperation. So unfortunately, some of what I'm gonna describe is partly a reflection of what we can measure, not necessarily what we would like to measure. Okay, so first let's, let's see one of the channels. Asset prices in March, as everyone now knows, became much more volatile. Figure two shows some deterioration in the market liquidity, which then fed back into prices through price volatility. This mechanically meant both types of margins had to rise. Um, market data such as prices, volumes, even liquidity metrics are reasonably easy to measure. Margin increases are generally more opaque. There's good data on margins for clear derivatives that comes from supervisors of central counterparties. However, data on margins for non-clear derivatives are patchy at best. And they have to be obtained either from funds via supervisory intelligence or estimated off of derivatives positions data. 
So the next slide shows what we can get. Uh, figures four and five show the levels of initial margin and variation margin that were posted during the stress for the centralized counterparties in the UK. There were significant increases in initial and vari variation margin calls on both cleared and uncleared derivatives. In the peak in March, daily gross variation margin calls, which mirror movements in the underlying markets by CCPs, the so centralized counterparties, were five times higher than the average in January and February. So around 30 billion. And the initial margin uh, change from January to March uh, was an increase of around 75 billion. Next, we can look at what happened to redemptions for money market funds. Here again, historical data are not readily available. So we only, we don't really have enough periods of stress to do a proper comparison. Figure six though does show you that there was a pretty big um, out, uh, outlier in March. Finally, um, we, we have very good uh, detailed data on guilt repo. We can see transactions volume here in this chart and the prices uh, as well as we can find prices and who traded with whom. But we have no direct way to observe whether it was rationing or whether dealers are being asked by clients to extend funding that they'd rather not have granted. And for that, we, we have to supplement our data with market and supervisory intelligence. In March, lending to clients and repo went up quite a bit, while lending by clients actually contracted. And the disruption of prices confirms that repo borrowing outstripped repo lending. So how did this all end? Well, as we all observed, the central banks responded to this turmoil with massive force. For instance, the Bank of England's purchases of gilts increased by 200 billion in March and will total 875 billion. The Federal Reserve's response was also enormous and came via the introduction of multiple programs. Ultimately, markets did calm down. However, the large central bank responses seemed to far exceed the need for funding. So understanding the full palliative effects of the intervention is an area of active research. In the meantime, there's a question. Can we understand why the amount deployed might have needed to be so large? And so this takes me to uh, my, my, my central point of the speech, which is to try to help you understand these liquidity, this liquidity multiplier. And, and that comes from understanding how actors in the change that I described earlier interact. The key idea is that the interactions create a cumulative need for liquidity that can far exceed the liquidity needs of any one party in the chain. So as an analogy, recall the money multiplier that many of you were taught in your basic university macro class and you probably never thought you were gonna see again. But I think the analogy can be helpful. So in the case of the money multiplier, the question asked is what happens when the central bank makes an open market purchase of let's say a thousand pounds and pays for the securities it acquires with reserves. Textbooks suppose that the initial thousand becomes available to the banking system to lend. So the fraction of reserves that will, uh, of, of the reserves will be lent on to a borrower. The borrower will choose how much of the loan to hold in currency and how much to redeposit. We then explain that the money will be redeposited and that allows the bank to lend another fraction of that redeposit to a new borrower. To a new borrower. The new borrower will retain some of the loan and redeposit the money. The public in this example thinks of the deposits and currency as both being money. So the ultimate in increase in the size of money in the example will far exceed the initial 1,000 because of all the redeposit and relending. The gap in the simple example depends on two behavioral choices, the fraction of the deposits that the banks opt to relend and the fraction of each loan that the borrowers opt to redeposit. So if you make the, you know, simple assumption that half of the money gets redeposited and the banks always retain half of what they get and lend the other half, the total size of the increase in the money supply in this uh, admittedly simple example would be 1,500 pounds. Now, what I wanna focus on is how the chain that I've described earlier amounts to the recycling of what happens of liquidity in the market-based financial system. In this case, 
each, uh, each link in the chain has one party receiving a liquid asset and the other party uh, receiving a, a runnable liability. And in this chain, the only exception to this rule is when a party decides to put some of the money in the banking system, either you know, making a payment or, or drawing down a deposit account rather than getting funded from another counterparty. In that case, the bank liquidity rules and access to the central bank ameliorate the run risk for the bank and stop the money being passed through the chain. So to see this more completely, uh, let's go back to our hypothetical example. I, again, I'm not gonna try to make realistic assumptions. I'm gonna make simple ones just to make the math easy to follow. Um, and so here we go. So let's go back to our, our pension fund manager. Let's say that she initially had a thousand in, in, uh, in the bank in idle cash that was there to pay out pensions or to meet margin calls. And she takes half of that thousand and puts 500 in the money fund. The money fund is required to retain some of that cash as a precaution. So let's suppose that the money fund lends only half, 250, in the repo transaction to the broker dealer and puts the rest in the bank. The broker dealer can then use the cash it receives to assist clients. Assume again, it takes half the cash and makes a loan via a term repurchase agreement to the hedge fund and deposits the other half in the bank. And this means that the hedge fund receives 125 through its repo agreement. If it deposits half of that, it can invest the other half, 62.50, into government bonds. Okay, so that's the chain that I've, I've spelled out there. Um, notice that this is an, exactly the same as the, the, the money multiplier, it's just the market version. Here we started with 1,000, which could have been simply put into the bank, we end up with 937 back in the bank, 6250 in government bonds, but another 500 in money market shares and 375 in government repo. Now, as far as everybody's in, in the chain is concerned, the total amount of liquid assets is the sum of all these things, 1875. So the size of the money, uh, the, the liquidity multiplier reflects a race between two forces, the number of links in the chain in which the funds are passed along, and the dampening of the interactions with the banking system when funds are placed there rather than passed on through the chain. I don't want to imply the banks themselves can't get into trouble with the deposits they receive. Likewise, they're also connected to the money um, market-based finance system in other ways that can create other important interactions and potential risks. But in the context of the liquidity multiplier, uh, the interaction with the banking system does tend to lim uh, limit amplification, partly because they have direct access to central bank liquidity support. Our interest in these chains, though, is not just what happens in normal times, but also what might happen in a period of stress when funding flows begin to reverse direction. These the shocks that create the stress might well lead some actors in the system to become more cautious so that they pull back from normal practices to accumulate extra liquidity. This behavior can mean the actors in the chain might go beyond just reversing their normal patterns and actually would draw even more liquidity than is normally present in the system. To see how this can work, suppose the pension fund withdraws its funds from the money market fund, say due to meet margin calls or for whatever reason, that doesn't really matter. So that's the first step. Now the money market fund can meet the redemption from, uh, from the cash it holds. However, it may not want to run down the buffer too much and it may choose instead to roll over its, uh, not roll over its repo uh, loan to the broker dealer. If the money market uh, fund becomes concerned that other redemptions are coming, it may cut back on other repo loans it has made or it might try to sell some of its other securities as a precaution so they can have more cash to meet redemptions. Absent constraints, the money fund would initially probably try to sell assets that will have the least impact, price impact from selling, but in practice, this is more complicated. If it happens to have a large enough buffer of, of securities that with minimal price impact, the selling would not necessarily exacerbate any of the problems in the market. But if it doesn't, then it could be forced to sell securities for which there's not an active deep 
uh, market. And in this sense, the surge in trading volumes that we saw in the US in March wasn't surprising. Next, the broker dealer has to find a way to fund its loan to the hedge fund. We'd assumed it was a term loan, so that's gonna remain in place for some time. It could sell some assets to receive funds that needs to replace the repo that, that disappears, or it could reduce the overnight repo it's offering, especially to smaller clients. In addition, the broker dealer may worry that the hedge fund is gonna request additional funding because the market conditions are now choppier, and the hedge fund may need to be paying uh, margin calls on its trade and expect to have other repo loans recall. As I indicated earlier, the business of the broker dealer involves helping clients receive funding. And this means in times of stress, the broker dealer is forced to extend credit that it might prefer not to, but failing to do so would lead the clients to move to a competitor. So at the same time, the broker dealer is seeing its own repo funding decline, it might be forced to expand its own repo lending. It has to do this, it will likely be selling assets to obtain the cash to undertake the loans. In our chain, we, we had the hedge fund buying government bonds. So if it loses the funding, it could potentially just sell those bonds. If instead it had the levered position, uh, to if it had levered its position to undertake a basis trade, then it would face margin calls from the price volatility. The high degree of leverage underlying the basis trade means that even small movements can create big gains or losses for the hedge fund. If the trade's moving against the hedge fund, the, its risk managers may conclude that it should exit the trade, which would con uh, contribute to further selling and price pressures. So in this case, the ultimate adjustment by the hedge fund could be much larger than one might expect from normal flows in the chain. The critical observation here is that because some of the parties are taking steps to build buffers against further stress, and because selling can move prices against the seller, the ultimate drain on the system can easily exceed the normal amount of liquidity that was being passed through the chain. Put differently, in stress, if the multiplier begins working in reverse, the needed adjustment can be larger than what might be expected based on business as usual flows. And this discussion identifies another problem. We essentially have a 20th century measurement system that's being used to monitor a 21st century financial system. So when it comes to putting realistic numbers into this kind of calculation, we find some critical pieces of the chain are not well covered. We do have good coverage in several areas, such as gilts, repo, and derivatives, but the challenge even with these data is to piece it all together. Furthermore, it's hard to tell the difference between forced action where somebody in the chain must immediately replace lost funding and those where somebody's just anticipating further problems and taking precautionary actions that cause problems for others. The staff at the Bank of England are working intensively on filling in as much of the landscape as we can over the next year. Importantly, some of the critical linkages go across borders, so some of the measurement challenges require international cooperation. And that's why the Bank of England is also helping lead the work by the Financial Stability Award to coordinate efforts across the globe. All right, so that brings me to my conclusion. Even with the caveats I just gave you, the examples I've shared allow us to reach a few conclusions and identify some important questions that deserve uh, further analysis. First, the market-based financial system is built on chains for many good reasons. Yet these chains create liquidity multipliers. What one party sees as a liquid asset, someone else in the chain sees as a runnable liability. Mechanically, this means when certain actors pull back funding and or markets become illiquid, the shock ripples through the market-based financial system. During periods of stress, the amplification can be especially large as parties in the chain take various defensive actions. Second, one of the major factors that dampens amplification is recourse to the various, uh, by the various parties to banks. A bank deposit is essentially always sufficient to make a payment. So every time an entity in a payment chain sets money aside in the form of a deposit, that can help reduce this amplification. Hopefully, we will not face a shock anywhere near as large as COVID, uh, the COVID one in the, in the near term. However, the recent experience can still teach us something about the system we have in place now and the risks that we reside in. So let me close with a couple questions that I'm thinking about, perhaps others will come up in the question and answer period. One is whether the regulatory system addresses the challenges adequately. 
We do have some protections in place that require uh, liquidity buffers for some sectors, but are they sufficient? And we can also ask whether or not the um, post GFC regulatory reforms have it, that we've enacted might have inadvertently created incentives to organize funding through chains that are particularly vulnerable. Next, what's going to be expected of central banks in the future? Um, in March, the stress was ended by a host of new programs and large expansion of their balance sheets. Should central banks be expected to repeat these actions? If so, is there a way to charge the beneficiaries for the support um, uh, pr provided by the liquidity insurance that the central banks have provided in some way, um, in some way. Finally, can we make a map uh, of the most important funding chains so that we can monitor them and potentially catch the problems before they appear? Armed with a map, we could then try to identify the links that are most fragile and begin trying to understand what can be do, done to strengthen them or move them, uh, move away from them. So anyway, thank you for your attention. I'd be glad to take a few questions. Um, I'll, I'll leave uh, one final slide up here that, that's got the references that I mentioned in the speech so that you can uh, find those if you're interested. All right, so back to you, Richard. Uh, thank you very much, Anil, for this very insightful discussion. Let me start with a few questions. James McIntosh from the Wall Street Journal is asking, does the increased importance of non-bank finance mean that central banks have no choice but to be market makers of last resort in a crisis? If so, is the moral hazard better, worse, or the same as the lender of last resort role? Well, I think that comes to the question that I put on the slide about whether there's a way to charge for the liquidity facility that you'd be setting up. So if you're going to be market maker of last resort, that means there's going to be some parties that are going to be on the winning end of, of the assistance. And uh, I do think if, if this is coming, uh, you're going to have to try to think about whether or not you want to um, figure out a way to charge for this. Perhaps there'd be access to the facilities uh, that would be pre-funded. Um, another question is how broad the market making would be. Uh, it matters, I, my own personal view again, not, not speaking for the FPC, is it would seem strange for any central bank to let the, the safe yield curve become unhinged. So doing things to stabilize the, the government bond yield curve strikes me as uh, business as usual for central banks, not something that's extraordinary. In fact, I don't see any moral hazard in saying the, the government's debt is not going to have, you know, spikes in its prices. So if the market making is purely in government debt, I think that's very different than if the market making is extended to other asset classes. And, and that's a decision that central banks will have to make. Um, hopefully, they're going to communicate their reaction functions about how they plan to do this. And I think that would play an important, um, you know, where you draw the line would be an important consideration whether you think this has got anything to do with moral hazard. A question from Andrew Bailey from the Just Group. At what point do central banks consider direct provision of liquidity to non-bank financial institutions who hold lots of financial assets? This has the March event to a failure of the commercial paper market as insurers and other non-bank financial institutions sought to return to cash. Central banks stepped in, but direct intervention may have been more effective. Yeah, I guess this is just another variant of the, the prior question. I, I assume that was the other Andrew Bailey, right? That wasn't <laughs> the, the governor. Um, so I think, um, you know, where the support is going to come is 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 an active policy decision. Uh, I think it would be the world would be a better place if the central banks announced ahead of time where support would be available, where it wouldn't. Um, I think there are many tricky design issues you would have if you were going to say we're going to limit, we're going to provide this support, but it's not going to be universal and um, if they say we're going to be buying things like commercial paper, 
then there's a question of who gets to sell it at what price they'll buy um, and, and all the rest. So th these are complicated issues that are gonna require a lot of consultation with the marketplace, a lot of communication from central banks. Hopefully we're not gonna have to do this anytime soon. And, and we'll have time to, to sort all this out. But I, I think that's that's a critical question and kind of implicit in it is this question of whether the central banks are, are gonna be stuck doing it. I certainly hear from many people in markets that they think that there's a, a put now forever. And um, I, I think the central banks are gonna work hard to try to clarify whether that's right. Another question that has come up uh, on my screen is about money market funds. Uh, the money market funds were a problem area in the 2008-2009 story. Uh, the regulators thought that they were doing lots of things to fix that. Uh, and yet the money market funds turned out to be a problem in March as well. Uh, do we really need them? Uh, is their business model viable anyway in a, in a negative interest rate environment? Shouldn't we just abolish them? Okay. Um... I guess there's there's different kinds of money funds. If, if for the aficionados that follow what the Financial Conduct Authority and the Financial Policy Committee have been talking about, we've been on this problem for over a year now, talking about some of the issues with open-end funds. I think the the funds that offer promises of liquidity when the underlying assets are fundamentally illiquid are the source of these these troubles. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, straight up government uh, money market funds are are usually pretty pretty much able to deliver on their promise. I mean, there there may be a small first mover advantage, but the the problem in some of these, let's say, so called prime funds, where the underlying assets might be things like that commercial paper that rarely trades, and that if you actually had to trade, it would involve a, a significant price concession, uh, are are a real issue. And uh, you'll notice that the Financial Stability Board has, has surfaced that in their, their paper that was just released. Uh, this, this is an area of intense interest and uh, a subject on which the, the FPC is continuing uh, to, to consider possible remedies. Um, I don't know that, that banning them all together is, is necessarily the answer, but I do think allowing somebody to promise liquidity when it's not there is not a good idea. And there, and you know, one of the things you could do is try to have more transparency around what is actually involved when you put money in one of these accounts and whether or not you can get them. The policy recommendation from the, from the FPC has been the principle that we care about is that the liquidity of the assets and the the ability to offer claims against them should be aligned. So you shouldn't have daily redemptions on, on securities that can't be sold uh, without price impact within a day. And you know that, that's kind of our, our basic uh, guidance, uh, trying to make that operational and, and figuring out exactly you know, how liquid some of these securities are under stress is a challenge. But it, yeah, I think I think there are problems in the money funds. It's something that the authorities are on and uh, you can stay tuned at the FPC to find out more. Right. Thank you, Anil. Um, the next question combines a few uh, from the uh, questions from the audience. It's about um, leverage. Are you at all worried about the leverage of non-bank financial institutions? How much do we know about this leverage? Can we measure it? Would you please comment on that? Yeah, so the leverage is definitely a, a consideration. If you sat down with pencil and paper and worked your way through my, my funding chain, if there isn't leverage and illiquidity, then what would happen is the money would just flow back. You know, at the end of the line, the hedge fund would sell its, its government bond. Um, everybody would just retrace all the steps. And, and the chain wouldn't really necessarily be so, so problematic. The problem comes for, for two reasons. First of all, if markets become illiquid and anybody has to sell to raise money to replace some funding that's disappeared, then, then that creates a, a bigger need. It can be pro-cyclical because you sell, the price moves, that forces others to sell. 
And then the leverage amplifies all of that. So in the basis trade where you've got you know, leverage of 25 or, or 40 to one, it doesn't take a very big price dislocation to create enough losses to where you, you then have to exit the position and sell quite a bit or, or your risk managers just push you out of it. So if there, it, the leverage is definitely a consideration, uh, but I, I think it can also just be market illiquidity. Either of those two things in stress will amplify the, the funding needs. And fundamentally, those are the, the same two factors that give rise to the precautionary demand for balances. Some of this is just, I think things are gonna get worse tomorrow, so I better sell while I can today, or I better just not lend and hoard my resources. So it, it, the, these frictions do matter. And, and the loss absorbency of the, the parties that are involved matter a lot too. And our ability to measure it, as I said, is not great. Um, the, that, you know, the, the line about the 21st century financial system being measured through a 20, 20th century telescope is, is pretty apt. It's a, it's a real problem. Uh, one final question I think we have time for, um, and that is uh, about from um, Premtim Sadku uh, from the London Business School Masters in Finance program. Uh, and he asks, he says, US dollar funding costs rose sharply uh, in the March events. Uh, from a cross border perspective, what do you think caused this? One might ask, add, of course, that the, the um, central banks were forced to step in with activating swap agreements uh, as well yeah. at that time. What, uh, what's the story there? Well, this is something we've been talking about. And, and so the, that slide I had that showed Andrew Hauser's speech and, and John Cunliffe's speech go into a lot of details about this. Um, some of it was selling by foreign central banks of uh, US uh, government securities that created price dislocations. Some of it was margin calls on derivatives where people, I mean, at, at the root cause of this, seems to be a desire for people to actually have bank deposits to make payments or a, a fear that nothing but a bank deposit was going to be good enough for what they needed it. And so you might have thought that a 17-year a treasury security is perfectly liquid or nearly perfectly liquid and would work for most purposes. But then if you suddenly decide you need to convert it into a, a bank deposit, um, there's, there's gotta be somebody to sell it to. And, and those, there's not a lot of trading in those kinds of things. So partly what the central banks did was by buying directly the government debt and putting reserves in the banking system, they made it e easy for everyone to get bank deposits. And, and that, that was what's going on. I think part of the, the reason for all of this is the opaqueness of the market-based financial system and not being able to really see exactly where all the flows were coming from what were the precise liquidity needs, who stopped trading, who, who uh, increased their hoarding, all of that stuff was going on. And, and it's something I'm, I'm afraid we're never really gonna have the answer because some of this stuff fundamentally wasn't measured at the time. Uh, but what we can do is get ready to measure better next time so that if, if something like this happens again, we'll be able to go back and do a kind of a forensic deep dive to say, you know, where were the sinkholes where all the liquidity was going? Um, but I, you know, I think it, it, it has taught us a lesson that even the US treasury market can get dislocated, then good luck for every other asset class. I'm afraid it wasn't going into my pockets anyway, that sinkhole, uh, but um, I'm afraid we now also, we now have to end this session. Thank you so much, Anil.